Hey guys, it's Lauren. Right off the bat, this is my editing Instagram. You should go follow it if you don't already. So if any of you guys follow me on The Talk, you'll know that I started this little series, don't really know if you could call it that, where I help you guys make your edits look better by giving you little tips. So I've uploaded two of those videos so far, but I'm very, very inconsistent when it comes to TikTok. And I don't wanna make you guys have to wait weeks until I decide to finally sit down and film a TikTok for you guys to get all these very helpful tips. So I just decided to do a video where I show you guys all of my favorite tips, but interestingly enough, in the form of skits, despite the fact that I can't act to save my life. Let's get into it. Lauren, I need your help. Okay, what's wrong? Right, so all of the slides and panning that I do using no object layers looks really, really choppy. Well, let's take a look. All right, here it is. Yeah, that does look pretty rough, I can't lie. So when doing slides or 3D camera panning that involves multiple clips moving in unison, we use what is called a null object layer. To add one, just go up to layer, new, null object. Then you wanna connect your two clips to the null object layer. To do that, you just wanna highlight both of them, hold down on one of these spirals, then drag it towards the null object layer, then let go. As you can see, our clips are both connected to null one. So now, if you mess with the position value of this null object layer, both of your clips are moving in unison. What you need help with is forming what are called mid-graphs. What you're doing right now is placing your first keyframe right where the beat hits in your audio so that the slide is very sharp and sudden. Also, your graph probably looks like this if you're using speed graph, or this if you're using value graph. What you actually want to do is drag your first keyframe towards the beginning of the null object layer, which is at least a couple of seconds before the beat hits in your audio. However, you want to leave your current time indicator, which is this blue line right here, right where it is so that it rests where the beat hits in your audio. So click on one of your keyframes and go back to your graph editor. First, you wanna make sure you're on speed graph. If your graph doesn't look like mine, just click right here and click on edit speed graph. Now we wanna form the shape of the graph so that the peak of the graph lays right on the current time indicator, which is where the beat hits. So I'm just gonna pull this knob on the right towards the middle. And I want the curve to be just a little bit more narrow. So I'm gonna squeeze it in a little bit more. So this is what it should look like, and we call it a mid-graph because it has its peak in the middle where your slide is moving the fastest. Nevertheless, instead of this movement happening out of nowhere, right here is where we ease into the movement so it's not as sharp and choppy. And this is what your new and improved null object movement will look like. Oh my god, Lauren, that looks so much better. What can I say? I'm a genius. Lauren, I'm so upset. What happened? Well, there's this new trend on TikTok where you make a velocity edit to the song Bills, Bills, Bills by Destiny's Child. So I wanted to make one, but all of my velocity is turning out so choppy. Okay, and what do you mean by that? Well, every couple of seconds, it kind of just pauses awkwardly so that when you're watching the whole thing, it's not smooth like you want velocity to be. Yeah, that looks off. What's the frame rate of your composition? 30 frames per second. Okay, that makes sense. I also use 30 frames per second. But what's the input frame rate of your Twixer settings? 30 frames per second? Ah, uh, I know what your problem is. So when using Twixter, which is a slow motion plugin, many people falsely believe that the input frame rate of your Twixter settings needs to match the frame rate of your composition. However, the input frame rate of your Twixter settings should match the frame rate from your source, the actual video. So to figure out the frame rate of your actual video clip, toggle on over to your project tab, and instead of looking at your composition, take a look at your original video clip. If you look over to the right, you can see the frame rate of your video. The frame rate of my video is 23.976, so I'm gonna go back over to my effect controls for Twixter, and I'm gonna change the input frame rate to 23.976. Now, as you can see, this velocity is a lot smoother. Oh my god, that looks so much smoother. I cannot wait to finish this edit. And I cannot wait to watch it. Lauren, I'm on the verge of tears. Oh lord, what's wrong this time? Well, I wanted to try a different editing style, and this includes a lot of shakes. Specifically, the type of shakes that you make with Sapphire Shake. I'm listening. Right, so I'm trying to do this like fast, glitchy, vertical shake, and something about it just does not look right. Alright, let me be the judge. Yeah, this needs some work. 
Alright, so in my time as an editor, I've discovered that S-Shake is one of the hardest effects to master. This is because you not only need to toy with the shake amplitude, but sometimes you need to mess around with all of the settings to get your desired shake. This can be really annoying and time consuming, but you shouldn't be discouraged from using S-Shake because your shake might not look perfect the very first time. So right now, I'm just going to create a random shake by only messing with the amplitude. So this is what it looks like. And it's okay, but it's really not all that. I probably wouldn't use it in an edit. Now what I'm gonna do is mess around with some of these settings to show you guys that it takes time to make the right shake. I'm gonna decrease the frequency, maybe change the phase of the shake, even change the motion blur length. And I'm just gonna increase the amplitude by one whole number. Now I personally like that a lot better. Also, if you're looking to save these S-Shake settings as a preset, you need to remember that it's not enough to only save the keyframes that are associated with the amplitude. Because if you only save these two keyframes, you're not saving your settings for the frequency, the phase, or the motion blur length. So if I wanted to save this shake as a preset, I would click the clock next to frequency, phase, and motion blur length. Then I would hit U on my keyboard to view all of these keyframes. I would highlight all five of them, go up to animation, save animation preset, so that when I look up this preset and add it to my clip, it looks the exact same as my original shake. Oh my god, that looks a million times better. Yeah, I know. Ugh, that giveaway was such a scam. My goodness, why would you say that? That's a really serious accusation. Well, I entered this giveaway to win a ton of shake presets, right? But then I added the shake presets to my clip, and it like moved the center of my clip over so that it wasn't anchored right. Okay, well of course that doesn't look too good, but I can explain to you why. Okay, so I'm gonna use one of my shake presets as an example. This really only happens with shakes that are made on position within transform, not shakes that are made with blurmo curves. So I made this shake preset while I was making an edit in the 1920 by 1080 format, which looks like this. Then I decided I wanted to use the shake on an edit that's a square, which is 1080 by 1080. So I add this preset to my square clip. Then I decide I wanna do a rotation transition. So I increase my rotation and look what we have here. That is not what a rotation should look like. As you can see, our anchor point is all the way over here. This happens because you're adding a preset that was originally made in a 1920 by 1080 format to a clip that is currently in a 1080 by 1080 format. Because the formats are different, your anchor point is going to get screwed up. This is because the anchor point of a clip in a 1920 by 1080 format is 960 by 540, while the anchor point of a clip in a square format is 540 by 540. So when you add a preset that was made in a different format, you can see it changes my anchor point to 960 for the first value. So to fix this problem, let's add something that we were talking about earlier, a null object layer. Just like before, go up to layer, new, null object, add your shake preset to the null object layer, then connect your clip to the null object layer. Now, if I check the anchor point of my clip, it's still 540 by 540. Even better, if I try a rotation transition, our rotation looks completely normal. It's really, really important to note that you must add the shake to your null object layer before you connect the clip to the layer. If you connect the clip to the layer first, then add your shake preset to the layer, something like this is gonna happen. Oh, that makes a lot more sense. Sorry to the giveaway owner for calling you a scammer. I didn't mean it. Lauren, I have a bone to pick with you. Oh God, what did I do this time? Well, I was just watching your shake tutorial and I followed it step by step. I did the exact same things as you and my shakes look nothing like yours. They're super choppy and I would never want to use them. Well, can I at least see what they look like? Okay, there's a simple explanation for all of this. All right, enlighten me. So in my shake tutorials, I teach you guys how to make shakes by showing you how far apart you should place your keyframes relative to each other. So for example, I like to have my first two keyframes two frames apart, and then the rest of the keyframes around seven frames apart. However, depending on the length of your clip, these may not be the best settings for you. For example, if you have a really lengthy clip like this one, your shake might end way too early if you use these settings. When your keyframes end early, there will be an awkward couple of seconds at the end of the clip 
clip where the clip is still and it's not moving. It just doesn't look right because the shake ends way too early. What you really want to do is just make sure that your keyframes last for the duration of the entire clip. You can move them closer to each other, farther from each other, you can even delete one if you feel like it doesn't look right. So what I'm going to do is spread out my keyframes and I'm also going to add an extra keyframe right here. See how much better that looks? It really fits the clip. So we've talked about what we should do when the clip is really long, but what if the clip is really short? So I'm gonna add a shake to this clip right here. And when we look at the position keyframes, we can see that the keyframes go way past the end of the clip. So just on pure instinct, some of you guys may push the keyframes back so that all of them fit within the parameters of the clip, but you actually should not do this because your shake is gonna be way too fast and look really choppy. When you have short clips, it's actually better when the shake keyframes go past the end of the video clip because the shake looks a lot smoother when the keyframes are spread out. Sorry for ever questioning the validity of your tutorials, and I'm glad you realized that. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. And before this video ends, I want to give a huge congratulations to the graduating class of 2021. Some of you may know I'm also a graduate myself and I will be attending Brown University in the fall. Two things that were really, really important in my college application were one, the personal narrative essay, and two, my passion project. I actually read my essay in a previous YouTube video, so you can go check it out if you want. But the personal narrative really allowed me to tell colleges who I truly was. And the second thing that I think was really helpful was my passion project, which is YouTube. Yes, you right now, you are a part of my passion project. My YouTube channel was something that really set me apart from the other applicants. So if you're looking to write a really fantastic personal narrative or to find your passion project, I definitely recommend the counseling services offered by Acceptitas. Acceptitas is a form of personalized college counseling that is run and founded by Harvard students. And it's filled with staff that are eager to help you with your storytelling skills, finding your own passions, practicing for college interviews, and much more. So if you're a rising senior or even younger than that and you wanna get started on the college process, I definitely recommend these services to give your application a little boost. You can check out their website linked in my description. And if you sign up with the link that I provided, you can get 15% off. All right, I hope this video helped you guys out. Have a great day or night wherever you are and bye.